Well, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I uh, am very grateful to uh, the Yesodaj Ratnam School of International Studies and to you for uh, having me here in Singapore. This is my third time in Singapore, uh, the only time I've been here for a more extended period, and I'm trying to learn about Singapore and about Southeast Asia and about Asia. And after six months and so, I think I've at least scratched the surface. Uh, and I'm grateful for the opportunity. I'm also great for the op grateful for the opportunity to have a distinguished fellowship here where I don't have to teach. Uh, and I can, I can therefore concentrate on, on trying to write a book. And um, I, I owe the institution something like a book, uh, either by the time um, my wife and I go back to Washington or shortly thereafter. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm trying to write a book. And the title that I've given to the book I had been advised by people here not actually to tell you, but I, I'm going to tell you anyway. But then, I'm, then I'll explain. I'll explain what the title means. You know, vernacular English does not travel as far as um, English as a second language or Singlish as a first language or whatever. It, 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 so there are some vernacular phrases that don't work. So I have to explain it. So the reason I picked this title is because um, you know, good titles sell books, and the person who knows more about good titles and selling books that anybody I know is Thomas Friedman, who I've known for many, many years. And Thomas Friedman and I had breakfast in Bethesda back in May, and he said, damn, Adam, that's a good title. So I'm going to use it. And the title is American Faceplant, How We Got Into This Mess and How to Get Out of It. Now, faceplant in vernacular American English means you know, you trip on a tree root or an, uh, or an uneven piece of sidewalk, and you fall flat on your face, right, in the dirt or you know, on the sidewalk, I've been told that here in Asia, the term face plant doesn't mean that. That sometimes it means you, know, you go like this, you hide your face in embarrassment. It could be a lot of confusion if you don't, but that's what I mean by it. I mean an embarrassing pratfall where you goof up, you trip, and you eat dirt, okay? Now the reason why I chose that, that phrase is because although, uh, although a, a face plant can be very um, painful and very embarrassing, it is rarely fatal. <laughs> and so I think uh, overall that the United States right now, American society, has lots of problems. So the basic answer to the question, what ails America, is a lot. But there have been predictions of American uh, decline and doom uh, since colonial times. It's part of who we are as Americans. We're very self-critical people. Uh, we have a Jeremiad complex. Uh, the term taken from the book of Jeremiah in the Hebrew Bible. Jeremiah was always saying, you are sinners and you are going to get it, you know, if you don't clean up your act. Well, the, you know, the, the, uh, the religious heritage of America in the Protestant Reformation and especially the Calvinist uh, shard of the Protestant Reformation has always taken Jeremiah very much to heart. Ever since the days of Cotton Mather and burning witches in Salem, Massachusetts, uh, these Americans really believe this stuff. America is actually the most religious great power in history. Um, G.K. Chesterton once said that America is a nation with the soul of a church. And he's absolutely right. He was absolutely right. It's one big continental size open air church. It's just that it's all secularized now and you don't notice how, how fundamental the religious um, civilization is to what Americans think and how Americans act. Um, but just because it's secularized doesn't mean that the underlying syntax of thinking and therefore of behavior isn't still there. It is. It affects American domestic politics and, and policy, but also affects even more, even more broadly, I think, American foreign policy especially when aroused, which is often the case. But we're not going to go into that right now because we have other things to do. This book that I'm trying to write uh, has sent me down into the doldrums of agony. And it has lifted me to the exhilaration, to exhilarations of joy when I think I figured out something because this is the hardest thing that I have ever tried to do in my so-called career. Uh, what I'm trying to do is get my arms around the big picture of what is really going on in American society. And it's down in American society and in American culture, right, that, that determines what happens in American politics. The politics stuff is the, the, you know, the part of the iceberg you can see. The real causes are below the water level. It's much harder to make them out. And what I'm really trying to do is to devise or come up with a unified field theory. Uh, of American political dysfunction, all right? And 
a better way to, if you don't know what a unified field theory is, let me just try to try to get back, get back into the vernacular. You know what a bagel is, right? Most of you know what a bagel is, even though we're in Singapore. You know what a, so there, different people like different things on their bagel. Some people like onion bagels. Some people like garlic bagels. Some people prefer sesame seeds. Some highbrows prefer poppy seeds, right? <laughs> then there's something called an everything bagel, right? Which is when you put it all on, right? I'm an everything bagel kind of guy. And what I'm trying to do is an everything bagel kind of approach, a synoptic approach to this problem of what is the matter. Now, as I said, it's been very hard. It's been very humbling. Uh, not because there aren't enough theories out there about what's the matter. There are too many theories out there about what's the matter. There are so many that we have, analytically speaking, a cacophony without a consensus. And we get angry at each other. Uh, the, the tendency to get angry is very um, uh, uh, common in America right now. But even scholars and, and intellectuals get angry with each other over this kind of thing. And uh, the reviews of books that people don't like are increasingly uh, splenetic and nasty. It's just a sign of the times that even the academy has lost some of its civility when these kinds of questions get discussed. So it's a little bit like uh, the famous story of the blind men all around the elephant trying to figure out what they've got their hands on, right? So some people will have their hands on one part or some anatomical zone, but nobody can stand back and figure out what the whole damn thing is, that it's an elephant. Uh, to, to get into somewhat more philosophical language, I mean, if you, if you want to think about it in terms of Kantian language, nobody can figure out uh, the unity in the manifold, as Hal Kant would have put it. So that's what I'm trying to do. My purpose is to get arms around all this. I found it very difficult. I'd say right now that I'm, in terms of the thinking and the shape of an argument that I'm trying to craft, I'm probably a third to a half of the way through. And I'm pretty satisfied now with the shape of the argument. Now, there's a lot of drafting and crafting, as we say, left to go. But I've got six months to do it, thanks to, thanks to Ambassador Ong. I have six months left to, you know, to hone it down and polish it. So I'm, I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about this right now. I'm sure there'll be adjustments course adjustments along the way as I try to write it out. But I'm feeling pretty good about it to the point where I can at least give you some sense of the shape of my argument and something about the content of it. Um, why me? Why am I doing this? Well, I'm very fortunate. I'm very lucky. Uh, some, there are a couple problems with the literature that, that's coming out about this. And they, believe me, it's just it's an avalanche. Every day a new book comes out purporting to understand what is the matter with us and what is the matter with the United States. But there, but there, are, two con there, there are sort of two sets of problems. Uh, in the academic literature, in the scholarly literature, there is so much academic specialization right now that it's very difficult for anybody to get anywhere in their career if they try to stand back and, and, and do a cross-disciplinary uh, synoptic uh, uh, view of a subject. It, it's not rewarded in the American university system right now. So you get a lot of, uh, a lot of data generation, but you get it diffused and defrayed. It's, you've never heard the, uh, the phrase uh, uh, attributed to Abraham Maslow that if all you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. Well, that goes for academic, academia, too. If you're an economist, then all of your problems look like economic problems, because that's what you know how to do. If you're a sociologist, then they all look like sociology problems. If you're a political scientist, so-called, they all look like political science, and so on. So it's very difficult to get to stand back and get a synoptic, you know, a unified field theory out of the academy uh, on this kind of thing. Now, when it comes to commercial publishing, there's another problem, a different problem. Commercial publishing has a business model nowadays where everything has to be short. The book has to be short, the chapters have to be short, the paragraphs have to be short, and the sentences have to be short. Because the business model of commercial publishing has changed because of these things. These things, and all that's related to them. Uh, people simply don't have the cognitive patience that they used to have, for better or for worse, mostly or for, for worse, I think. And so, uh, you know, a lot of stuff is dumbed down. And the way it gets dumbed down is really two, there are two ways it gets dumbed down. One is uh, uh, some, some uh, um, intellectuals decide that they're going to find some, some hoary concept, conceptual way of, of talking about the problem that's been very successful in the past, either for them or others, and use it again because it's successful. So for example, we have a new book now out, I won't, talk, won't mention any names, that says that we're in a new class war. 
Well, class war, boy, that's a very popular motif. That really gets people's pulses up, right? Uh, that, just, that just, you know, creates ideological dust all over the place. Uh, the, the problem is, is that um, uh, the, uh, the basis of the argument is so narrow it only looks at economic uh, situations, the economic aspects of so-called class war. Doesn't talk about the cultural piece. Doesn't talk about any other piece. So the book claims maximal payout, right? But the superstructure of the analysis is too weak to support the weight of the claim. Similarly, we have other another method of uh, of trying to find some sort of shortcut or or you know uh, principle of exclusion is the idea I found a new connection that nobody has found before and this new connection right explains all explains all so we have a book now about um, the entitlement culture that's come out in the last couple of weeks by I know both of these guys these friends of mine uh, both of these both of these books by the way have a chunk a piece of the truth but again they're, they're designed by commercial publishers to be short and dumbed down enough that they they can't support the, the the, 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 the analytical superstructure can't support the weight of the argument. It's too thin. So we have problems with both kinds of literature. And that's why uh, I'm lucky. I'm lucky because for the last 20 years, pretty much, I have been the editor of a thought magazine. And some of the best and most eclectic thinking on this subject has simply come to my desk. I mean, I've been sitting in the catbird seat. So I've had to read all this stuff. I've had to understand it all. I've been reading my competitors and other colleagues from other magazines. So I mean, I have, I think, a better, uh, you know, a broader view of, the, of what the literature is and what the thinking is than, than most other people have been able to gather just from having been the editor of a thought magazine for, you know, for 20 years. I've also worked in government and I've also been in university life and I've also been in think tank life. So I have a, I have a, a kind of a varied experience here that, that I I think helps me out uh, more than just somebody who's been uh, at a university their whole life. Um, so I think that's an advantage. And then I have a purpose in doing this. The purpose is that my wife and I have five grandchildren. And I think this, the problem is actually quite serious in the United States. Uh, we don't, I mean, I don't know. In the, there have been people, there have been worries about this in the past. Like I saw, so in the late 1970s, for example, uh, was a really terrible time in the United States, middle and late 1970s. We had inflation, we had stagflation, we had the Soviet uh, and Cuban troops in Africa. I mean, things look really terrible. I mean, if you're old enough to remember Jimmy Carter's famous Malay speech, you get a feeling for what it was like to be. And then what happened? Okay, what happened? What happened was the American economy recovered. With new leadership, American confidence returned. And 10 years after that, it was the Soviet Union that ended, ended up in Trotsky's dustbin of history, not the United States. So the doomsayers have often been proven wrong, which doesn't mean that they're wrong now. So the question becomes, is this just another swoon? Is this, is this just another business cycle? Will the United States again reinvent itself as it has in the past and come out stronger and better than before? Or not? Well, we don't know. And if you don't have a synoptic diagnosis of the problem, you don't know how to fix it. It's like, it's, think, think of a medical metaphor. If you don't know what's wrong with a patient, all right, how are you going to make the patient better, except if you're lucky? Well, it's the same deal here. I mean, I believe in human agency. If we have problems, some of them might be fixable. But you can't fix them if you don't know, what the, you know, if you don't know what's wrong. So the, pur the purpose of this is actually practical. And it's practical because my wife and I have five grandchildren. And it would be irresponsible of me, I think, to do nothing about this because we love our grandchildren. So that's, that's, that's the setup here. So now, what's the, uh, what's the shape of the argument? Let me see if I can explain this to you succinctly in the time that I have. First of all, before I actually get into the argument itself, <clears throat> as I said, a lot of these problems uh, have been with us for a while. Uh, people were, you know, back in, for example, back in 2013, just to take, what's that, seven years ago? You know, after the, the what we call in America the Great Recession, uh, outside of America, people have different names for what happened in 2008, 2009. But that was a period of um, uh, a real undermining of American self-confidence. Because a lot, of, a lot of really bad stuff happened. If you read uh, the big short, uh, you sort of see how 
how much fraud and disingenuity and how many scoundrel cascades there were in an array of American institutions. And, when the, and then, of course, everybody knows and the little guys know. So the banks got bailed out, the people who lost their, their equity in their home, they were left to fend for themselves. And so we had the Tea Party and we had Occupy Wall Street and we had all these reactions to this. And people, you could feel it, you could smell that something was, something was rotten, not in Denmark, but, but in the United States. Maybe in Denmark too, I don't know. But in the United States. And uh, people began to get this kind of bad feeling uh, that the politicians weren't being honest. And this, this was a cascade on top of many, many years before of the undermining of trust uh, on the part of most Americans in, in uh, American institutions, political institutions. It was a piling on. But what was so interesting is, if you, if you go back and you look at the literature, the, you know, the let's fix it, fixing America literature from, say, 2013, one prime example is an article in Foreign Affairs by my friend Fareed Zakaria, Can America Be Fixed? This was in the January, February issue of Foreign Affairs, uh, 2013. And uh, uh, if you go back and read it now, Right? It's not, not a long article. If you go back and read it, uh, what, what, what really stuns you is how absolutely simple and mild the definition of the problem was as it looked from the year 2013. It was all about the so-called fiscal cliff. It was all about uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the budget deficit and the national debt. It was all about economics. Right? There was not a word about immigration and demography. There was not a word about culture. There was not a word about the erosion of institutions. And it, it, it wasn't a bad article that Fareed wrote. It was very typical of what was being written at the time. Right? If that were our perception now of the problems in the United States, right, we would want to drop to our knees and say, Hosanna, we've been saved. If that's all that's the matter, oh, big deal. Well, in the last seven years, that's clearly not the case anymore. Uh, people have a much more dour and broad spread sense that something is seriously wrong in the bloodstream of the country and the culture. And, uh, and that's the difference between what, was, what, was, what people thought and felt seven years ago and what they feel now. Now, of course, one of the reasons for that is the man who, who now occupies the Oval Office. Because it didn't take long for reasonably intelligent people to conclude that the man who now occupies the Oval Office does so because he is a symptom. He is a symptom of much deeper maladies that have been developing, combining, metathesizing now for decades. Now, he, he, I will not mention his name, he <laughs> is also a consequent accelerator and deepener of these, of these difficulties, but he did not cause them. And that's important. It's very important for people to understand this because one, at one point or another, one way or another, he will no longer be president. And if people think that when that occurs, everything is going to snap back the way it was, I'm very sorry. That's just not going to be the case, all right? Uh, things were not peachy. Uh, the American political class and the American political elite before his election uh, were not um, uh, uh, unblemished miracle to humanity. I mean, they made lots and lots of mistakes. Uh, so uh, this, is a, this is a condition that is not going to go away with, with the rescission of one individual. Now. I have, been, I have identified essentially seven arguments that are out there. So my, the shape of my argument is seven, three, and one. I've identified uh, seven sort of chunks of the literature, claims about what is the matter with the United States. And I'm going to just list them for you. Uh, if we had until you know, Monday afternoon, I could actually discuss all of them. I could give a lecture on each one of them. This is a very capacious problem we're dealing with, in other words. Let me just list them for you. So the first is, there have been several uh, books that talk about the American meritocracy run amok. Uh, as some of you probably know, when Michael Young coined the term meritocracy back in the 1950s, he did it with mischief on his mind. All right? It was a dystopia that Mr. Young was describing when he, when he coined the term. Uh, and a lot of it seems to have come true. There is now, there is, there are several, several uh, renditions of the argument that we now have what amounts to an overclass or a budding aristocracy in the United States. And that these uh, so-called meritocrats, you can, you can call them their, their lawyers and their accountants and their business executives, and they're the people that made it to the top by merit in the American system, that they have made common cause with uh, plagues of lawyers, uh, plutocrats, uh, m corporations, and money to basically lock in their advantages at the top of the American heap and to preserve them and hand them down through a sort of marriage and other techniques to kith and kin in a way that is harder to permeate even than the aristocrats of old. 
So this overclass is presumed to have sold the average American down the river. All right? Uh, and uh, they are, for example, wonderful ideas about exporting American manufacturing jobs overseas, including to China. What happens to the, the typical American whose job has been exported? It's great for Goldman Sachs, right? It's maybe not so good for Main Street and Middle America. They could give a damn. All right? Because the, the motto was, you know, uh, IBG, UBG, right? I'll be gone, you'll be gone. We'll make our money, you know. What comes next, we don't care. Uh, this kind of hollow, rotten, rotten sense of, 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 of a really extreme individualism, greed, greedy, selfish individualism among the, the, the meritocrats, that is the subject of several books that try to explain what has gone wrong. And there's, there's merit in this argument, in my view. Second, there are a lot of people who are really um, made nervous by the populist impulses we spy in American politics. And by the way, uh, I should have said before, uh, uh, some, of these, some of these elements are common not just to the United States, but to the West in general. And even some countries, some OECD countries and wealthy countries outside the West. All right? But I'm focusing on the United States. And if you, if you want to interpret the wash over to European countries and Japan and other countries, that's, that's your business. And you'd be, you'd be you know, fine if you do that. So the second one is, is populism. It's populism. A populism is to some extent a reaction against the abuses of the meritocracy and the plutocracy and the lawyers and so forth and so on, the overclass, depending on what vocabulary you choose. Um, uh, and populism really annoys uh, uh, people in Europe in particular, but it also annoys a lot of Americans. Uh, and there's been a lot of literature about uh, the depredations of populism and the irrationality, the huge washing wave of irrationality that seems to characterize the way that um, some folks think about politics, uh, the denigration of expertise of all kinds, uh, the viscera with which um, uh, people with new ideas about politics, they think they're ideas. Most people actually uh, uh, in the populist and the populist domain, especially the more illiberal uh, right of center populist domain, it's a people who are newly educated in many respects, think they have ideas, but they actually can't reason their way to the ideas themselves. So more likely, more often, as has been the case in the past in history, it's other people's ideas that have them is often what happens. And the, there's actually a very a prophetic book written in 1930 uh, about this very phenomenon. It's called The Revolt of the Masses. It's by Ho Jose Ortega y Gasset, Spanish analyst. Uh, when you read that book today, right, after 90 years now, shivers go up your spine when you read that book. It's incredible. So populism. The third one, third factor, is institutional decay. Institutional decay is, this is the sort of thing that political scientists and, uh, and sociologists like to point to. They look at the Congress, the dysfunction of the Congress, its inability to actually get anything serious done. They look at things like gerrymandering. They look at things like uh, campaign finance insanity, so that the amount of money pulsing through American politics uh, is wildly distortive. There's no, uh, there's no relationship anymore between you know, one vote, one man, one vote, one person, one vote. It's who has the money to buy the votes. And the campaign finance system is such, you read all kinds of accounts about congressmen coming to Washington, congressmen coming to Washington for the first time. And they, 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 they show up as idealists. And they very soon become realists. And within about a year or two, they become cynics. That's the pattern. But what else could be the case when they have to spend half their time on the phone trying to raise money? And, tra and used to be when I, I worked in the Senate back in the, just after the Crimean War, I think it was, late 70s, <laughs> right? Where, where, yeah, I mean, you know, uh, uh, typical congressman or the senator would, would actually like to, to go out and play golf with lobbyists because some of, the, some of the issues are really very complicated and lobbyists understood them. But money bought access then. It didn't buy votes. It certainly didn't buy the right to walk into a congressional office and write the legislation, which is actually what happens now in Washington. Um, it, it's, it's basically a, you know, it's a money go round. Uh, the amount of money that courses through and the way that it has corrupted uh, American uh, legislative politics is amazing. And there's more. Uh, I mean, one could argue about this, I suppose, but the Supreme Court, the Roberts Court, has made some really bizarre uh, decisions over the past three or four years. F four or five of them stick in my mind. I could, if we had time, I could list them for you. You could ask me about them if you want. But I mean, it's just bizarre kinds of things. Uh, Citizens United stands out in my mind, but there are many others. In Citizens United, the court basically argued that uh, a corporation has political voice. 
as an individual. But everybody knows that a corporation is a partnership. If it weren't a partnership, then the right to collective bargaining, allowing labor to also become a partnership, would make no sense. I mean, you, you, this is not rocket science. This is pretty simple stuff. So some of these court decisions have, uh, have uh, you know, are, they are examples of institutional dysfunction, but they've made institutional dysfunction worse in other parts of the government. And now, thanks to the current occupant of the Oval Office, we now have roaring institutional dysfunction and the undermining of norms in the executive branch, which until now had been more or less, more or less insulated from, from a lot of these ravages, unless you, unless you, um, um, uh, you know, de unless you go into details about how budgets are formed. Speaking of the budget, I mean, the Congress hasn't been able to, you know, to pass a budget on time, a reasonable budget, in a long, long while. We've had government shutdowns. I mean, every other democracy in the world that has budget problems, right, they, they have uh, automatic continuing resolutions. So that if Congress can't come to a new budget, the, the government is simply funded at the, at the same level that it's been funded, until a new budget is passed. I mean, it shuts the government down. Only Americans shut their government down. I mean, this is just nuts. It really is nuts and totally, totally unnecessary. And I could go on with examples of, of institutional dysfunction, but now we have an executive branch in which the, again, the occupant of the Oval Office has disintermediated right, the entire national security structure from his Twitter account. Uh, th this is unprecedented. I mean, the National Security Council has not met as a group in more than 20 months. Uh, he, so, uh, so now that the, the, the level of institutional, and look, look at the State Department, I mean, where I used to work, for God's sake, people are leaving in droves. You have a Secretary of State who won't even, won't even stand behind his own ambassadors and then lies about it. I mean, it's just aston really astonishing. So the level, the, the scoundrel cascades are accelerating and they're spreading, and it's, it is undermining both the norms and processes of just about the entire U.S. government. Now, next, polarization. So we're on four now, polarization. And I don't mean by polarization that people disagree about stuff. Americans have always disagreed about stuff. And it could be boiled down so, to some very fundamental issues. I mean, should the government be, as most of the framers back in the day, you know, 230 some years ago, should the government be basically a small government kind of thing? Should the federal system really be leveled out in favor of, of state and local authority, right? Or should the government essentially be uh, a nanny state? Or should the government, you know, be responsible for um, uh, uh, ameliorating all sorts of social problems? Uh, this is a difference in, in philosophy of government about what, what the government's role. There's serious disagreements about this. Right? But that's not the same as the polarization that people talk about now. It's one thing to, to have a different view, a very different view. It's another thing to hate the person who has, a, has the other view. This is visceral now. This is absolutely uh, emotional uh, so that people in Congress and people in the, don't even talk to each other. That just wasn't, that wasn't the case at all when I, when I worked in the Senate. So this is a dramatic sea change in, civil, in the levels of civility. But it's not just civility. I mean, there's an organization in Washington that basically argues that if people would just be, if politicians and political class types and media people would just talk more civilly to one another, that everything would be okay. Well, that's kind of, that's kind of naive. I mean, there are real disagreements uh, based on real principles. And just being nice to one another is not going to make them go away. A polarization is very serious. Then. Uh, on a slightly different level, but I think very important, we have had hemorrhages of social trust in the United States for many years now. Robert Putnam wrote famously about this in his book, uh, Bowling Alone. I'm sure many, many of you have heard of it. But since then, there's been a lot of research, a lot of empirical research on, on hemorrhaging of social trust. And uh, this is a real, real serious problem. Uh, I've written on this before. Um, and so that's, that's another one. Then. Um, uh, a whole different sort of basket, and now we're down, I think, to number, where are we, six, what I call turbo capitalism and uh, industrial folklore. Uh, turbo capitalism is a term that was coined by my friend Eddie Lutwak uh, many years ago, in the uh, late 1980s. Uh, uh, Eddie was actually one of the first people to see that there were downsides to globalization. Amazing, but uh, a lot, in the beginning, I mean, again, my, my friend Thomas Friedman, who I do love, wrote the book, The World is Flat. Man, did Tom get it wrong. Uh, Eddie got it right. Uh, there are downsides to globalization, just like there are downsides to a lot of things that seem, seem good. Uh, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, there are downsides, and sometimes the downsides will uh, undermine 
the benefits, depending on you know what side of the fence you happen to be sitting on, uh, you know uh, whose ox get, gets gored and, and and whose cow gets fed by by these new these new processes. Um, and industrial folklore is an, also a term that I did not invent. It's a term invented by Professor, uh, the late Professor George Gerbner, uh, University of Pennsylvania, the man who created something called the mean world syndrome, if any of you know what that means. It's just the idea that when you socialize children into uh, a political culture, you do so by telling them stories of credit and blame. And you sit down by the fire and the parents and the aunts and the uncles and the grandparents uh, and they pass on the values. And these values are uh, in human culture, they are very fragile. They, they hang on, go on gossamer threads. And if they're not transmuted, they break, all right? And what do we do now, according to uh, Professor Gerbner, what do we do now? What do we do? We sit, sit the kid in front of the television set and uh, the company's selling them toys and razor blades and beer. They're telling them stories of credit and blame, but they're not the same stories, right? So do we really want, do we really want the stories we tell about our society to be, to be peddled mainly by people trying to sell, you know, shaving cream? Uh, shouldn't we actually be sitting by the hearth and be, be families, right? So the isolation and the, uh, the, the bifurcation of sort of the normal methods of sociology, part of turbo capitalism, because turbo capitalism is not your father's capitalism. It's not Adam Smith's capitalism. It's very different from the small shopkeeper, petite bourgeois capitalism that is our model of how a free market works. We have massive rentier elite uh, uh, a political economy in the United States right now, and every every country does. To some extent, it's forced by the nature of technology, but to some extent, it's forced by the machinations of plutocrats who are gaming the system for their own benefit. And that goes back to the the, the meritocracy, right, which which enables and, and streamlines this, these capabilities. So we don't have robber barons today in the United States or in Europe like like the like the railroad barons of the 1890s, right? We have gray suited, automatonic, rentier organizations. Just take the healthcare sector, right? We have two very large healthcare uh, insurance companies in the United States that are technical, technically non-profits. One is called Kaiser Permanente, the other is called Blue Cross Blue Shield, all right? They pay their CEOs the same as for profit um, uh, uh, insurance company. They have to because that's where the market is. Uh, uh, but there are other models of doing this in Germany and in France, for example. Uh, there are large insurance companies for healthcare, but they're all non-profit. They're all non-profit. They're private. But they're nonprofit. In the United States, you know, speckled here and there in, in healthcare, in education, uh, in, um, in, uh, in transportation, really all in housing, all over the economy, but especially in medicine and education, we have these rentier elites who are, who are siphoning off uh, rewards based on their positions, their, their positions in the market. And um, government has contributed to, the, to their, their ability to distort, distort the market. Because there is no more free market for these kinds of, these kinds of, of uh, services in the United States. I mean, it's almost impossible to imagine how there could be, all right? Uh, and now we have the tech companies. Now, tech companies are a special case. Every other, uh, every other aspect of, of critical infrastructure in the United States, whether it's your electricity grid or the people that you sell you the gas to heat your house, whatever it is, right? Uh, there's a model that, that is used almost universally in situations like this, and it's called a public utility, right? It's a monopoly, but it's a public, publicly regulated monopoly. Because how much sense would it make to have a free market for electricity? Would you really want nine or ten companies in your county, you know, digging lines and putting up telephone poles? It's ridiculous, right? Well, so there's a kind of logic here. Why is, why are the tech companies, why, why is, is, why are all these tech companies, why are they not treated as utilities like every other aspect of, of, uh, of critical infrastructure? Um, I don't know. I mean, Elizabeth Warren has raised this. Not that I'm a great fan of Elizabeth Warren, but she's right to raise the question. So we have all kinds of difficulties uh, when it comes to the kind of capitalism we have now, which is not like the kind that the, the, uh, the founders would have recognized. We have a lot of literature on this. One of the best books is a, it's already an old book uh, by Richard Sennett called the, the, the Culture of the New Capitalism. It's a short little book. It's an excellent book. There's been lots of stuff written on this. And a lot of people in our political class keep pretending that free markets and, and capitalism looks, looks today just like, it, just like it looked in 1850. Well, it doesn't. It's, it is a new animal, and we don't really understand it very well. But it is prone to, pl to plutocratic abuse, and it, it is also prone to being itself uh, a, 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 a suck on social capital, all right? Social trust. And finally, so I've saved the seventh for, uh, for last, uh, what I call the technovelty tsunami. 
And I really don't have to explain, technology is my term, right? Obviously a compound word between novelty and technology. I like, I like neologisms. If you don't, that's, that's your choice. I like neologisms when they, when they express what I want to say. So <clears throat> tech, the, the tech novelty tsunami, and I really don't have to explain what I mean. The technology, the IT now, the IT slash AI technology that is coursing through all of our societies is changing practically everything. It's changing the way people relate to one another. It's changing, um, you know, uh, just social discourse. It's changing the way we talk about politics. It's changing everything. Now I want to just point out that these seven categories that I've now iterated and very briefly explained, they don't live in segregation and separation. They mix with each other. I'm going to give you an example. Polarization. We all know about polarization. What would polarization be without social media, right? So these things compound one another. They mix with one another. They, they create state changes when they combine with one another. You could, and I will, uh, just, just ele for the, an elementary way to show this, you could make, I could make, we could make a seven by seven grid matrix. List all seven of these factors down the x-axis, uh, the x-axis, pardon me, put them on the y-axis, you know, block out the diagonal and see what happens when these combine. I've just given you one example, but there, there are dozens of examples. And it's, of course, not just two factors possibly combining. It could be three. could be four. So I might need a, you know, a seven-factor, you know, really sophisticated model to, to, to conceptualize this. Um, if we did that, all right, if we took these seven factors and we saw their interactions and we connected all the dots and looked at all the novel combinations they produce, right, would we have... What I'm looking for, will we have a unified field theory of American political dysfunction? No, we would not. All right? I think that all three, all seven of these, these factors, about which a great deal of literature has already been produced, of varying qualities, are actually derivative and epiphenomenal of three more basic fundamental um, causes of what's going on. And they are deeper in the culture. Uh, I wish I had you know, a lot more time to talk about them, I don't. But I'm just trying to sketch the argument. So let me just tell you what the, what the, what the three are. One of them, or maybe two of them, might surprise you. One of them is affluence. The United States, and not just the United States, has become amazingly affluent. We've done it in pulses. There was the amazing affluence that erupted after the end of the Second World War. But then after the end of the Cold War, uh, it's, it, if you look at the numbers, it's like quadrupled. I mean, we are just incredibly rich, all right? So one of the things that we did, just to give you an example, uh, in, in the 1950s, 1960s, coterminous with the civil rights um, uh, movement in the United States, is we created an entitlement culture. I mentioned a book about this. Well, you can't create an entitlement culture unless you have a buttload of money to finance it, can you? All right? It's a little like, can you imagine the difference between, and anybody can understand this, even if you're not rich like me, D does somebody, does somebody, does somebody who, who, who you know, uh, earns, earns, let's say, earns the, uh, a second million dollars or a third million dollars, does that person think about that million dollars the same way that he thinks about the first hundred thousand dollars that he or she earns? Of course not. The first hundred thousand dollars is money you spend, all right? The, the, the second million is money that either gets invested or taxed or both, right? So money is, money is not uniform in the way that it is understood and used. The same thing goes with a, a national culture. If you're able to finance all the things that you, you think are fundamental you know, obligations of the federal government, and then you have this buttload of money left over, well, you might as well do something with it, right? So we, we start these entitlement programs. Some of them, of course, go back to the New Deal, but, but the, uh, the burst in the 1960s you know, with Medicare and Medicaid and revising Social Security eligibility and, and benefits and so forth, right now, as a result of this, get, you know, with the changes in demography in the United States of baby boomers like me, you know, coming toward retirement, now we have a budget, if you include discretionary and non-discretionary parts of the budget, right, that if you didn't know better, if you were a Martian and came down and looked at the budget, it would look like an insurance company with an army, all right? <laughs> This was not deliberate, but this is what happened. And this is what happens when you're affluent and you have all this money and you don't know what to do with it. There are many, many other implications of affluence. Uh, I have a quote from uh, East of Eden 
by John Steinbeck from back in the 1930s where Steinbeck, where Steinbeck says, and through as one of his characters, you know, uh, something to the effect that I've never seen. You, if, you, if, you, if you take a rich man, you give him a house, you give him food, give him everything he needs, he'll, he'll immediately become miserable, right? And it's a problem. If, if all you are concerned about is getting out of poverty and, and creating a certain level of material abundance, you always then will have a point B problem. Okay, we've done it. We succeeded. We're rich. Great. Now what do we do? What do we do next? What's this for? Why do we do it? All right? And you, you, sometimes places get so good at this kind of thing that they just keep doing it. All right? Because they don't want to reflect on where point B is because they don't know. All right? Affluence has all kinds of other uh, uh, problems. For example, uh, lately in, in uh, some of the intellectual discourse, we are seeing a regression away from philosophical free will. This, this comes in pulses. So Marx told us that we don't really have free will because our relationship to the means of production determine everything that we think and everything that we do. And then a little later on, Freud comes along and he says, we don't really have free will, right? It's our subconscious, right? We're made up of all these pre-conscious uh, uh, urges and motives, so we don't really have free will. We're, we're, we're driven by these, these, inner, these inner impulses we don't even understand and can't control. And now we have the geneticists come along and say, well, we don't really have free will. Okay? The genes, the circumstances of your birth and your genetics determine everything you do, so, so just relax, buddy. This is a regression back to before the Abrahamic Revolution, right? when in the ancient world, the idea of cyclicalism and fatalism was almost universally the way people thought about things. But this is a huge regression. But this plays in to the problem of, uh, of affluence. What do people do once they don't really need to do anything? Is everybody going to become an Eloy? Like in H.G. Wells' you know, the movie, the, the book, The Eloy? The, 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 like walking around like glassy-eyed cattle, right? For the Morlocks to take them down and, and eat them. Uh, is everybody going to become an Eloy? I mean, it's a little bit like the, uh, you know, the argument if you watch the, the TV show The Good Place, right? Which I really think is really terrific. So, you, so what do you do? They get to The Good Place and then they, what do they see? Everybody is walking around like an Eloy, all right? Or if, if you want to get a little bit more esoteric in literature, go back and read, I think it's 1913, go back and read um, uh, Don Juan in Hell from uh, George Bernard Shaw's play Man and Superman. Same thing, all right? So we know about this. We know about the problems of that, and Hegel for that matter, the last man, the bored last man. This is deep, deep in the Western philosophical tradition, but never occurred to us, all right, to think about what the downside of affluence might be. So a big part of the book is going to be tracing how affluence feeds these seven distempers that I've described. Second one uh, is uh, it's a branch of, it's, a, it's an emanation of the tech novelty tsunami, and that is the erosion of deep, deep literacy. Uh, my uh, colleague, Marianne Wolf, uh, has written brilliantly about this, and I could, I could talk about it for a long time. Let me just say, everybody knows nowadays, again, because of these things, and you see the, you see the students at, at NTU, Walking around like this, all right? <laughs> it's not funny. It's not funny. What, they are addicted to their phones, and I'm not speaking metaphorically. I'm speaking neurophysiologically. They are rewiring their brain circuitry, and they don't know it. And you see people on the MRT, parents, right, giving a four-year-old this thing, right? It's not funny. I mean, I absolutely cringe when I they don't realize what they're doing to their kids. They, they, these things, they create addiction to distraction. They create feedback loops that are addiction to distraction. They destroy cognitive patients. They make it impossible for people to be with their own thoughts. And with, what does that mean? What is the definition of thinking? You know what the etymology of, of the verb to think is in English? It is to cause to appear to oneself, right? The cause to appear to oneself. How can you think, right, if you're never alone with yourself? If you've always got something plus, it's really a serious problem. It's not, it's not funny, all right? So, the erosion of deep literature, of deep literacy, again, to just race through this. Read the book, you'll learn more. It does four things to us. Uh, when we lose our cognitive patience and we, we lose our deep literacy, we can't read books any, really can't. Uh, Nicholas Carr wrote a great book about this called The Shallows about 10 years ago. Which he, he starts the book by saying, I used to be a great reader, I used to read all the time. But now I, you know, I'm on this, the phones and the screens and all, now I sit down at night to read a book and I can't read it. My attention, I can't, my, my, my attention is bouncing off the wall, like, you know, like, 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 like uh, ping pong balls in a, in a salon. I can't, I can't sit still. You know, my attention span has been shot to hell. But again, it's a neurophysiological phenomenon. It's not just a metaphor, right? Um, here are the four things that happen to you, that happen to people, right, when they can't, when they don't deep read, when they don't get their arms around ideas in a book scale 
in a book scale project. First, your capacity for inferential, inferential reasoning decays. I won't explain it. Second, your capacity for empathy decays, right? What, what, what's, what's the use of reading a novel? A novel is a, la a moral laboratory into the mind of another human being, right? It's part of the, the, the ever-evolving theory of mind that adults take with them if they're active adults all through their lives. If you stop reading, how do you, you can't, you can't possibly meet every other person in your own society, let alone other societies. How are you supposed to figure out what the intersubjective formula is to communicate with another human being. If you don't know that, it's so easy to get angry. It's so easy to dehumanize others because you have no theory of mind of what they might be thinking. Uh, uh, the erosion of deep literacy also makes it impossible for people, not impossible, much more difficult for people to imagine and to plan. To imagine and to plan. And then the worst thing that it does, because people lose cognitive patience, skim reading has become the new normal, right? And it has a shadow effect. When you skim read on the screen and then you go to read something serious, you're still skim reading. You can't stop. You can't go back and read seriously. You can't go back and read closely. And same thing with our, your emotions. You know, you can, you can friend somebody on Facebook, right? You all know that, right? To make a friend is one of the most beautiful things that human beings have ever been able to do, right? But what does it take to really make a friend? It takes an enormous, enormous investment of time and, and concern. A friend is a beautiful thing. To say that you can friend somebody like, you know, with, a, with a button, right? <laughs> this, is, this is obscene. To me, this is obscene, right? But to get back to the point, the fourth thing that happens if you, if you lose your capacity for deep, for deep literacy is what happens when something actually difficult confronts you, either as an individual or as a society? What happens? Well, uh, if you can't slow down long enough to, to figure out you know, what the problem is, if, and if you're used to being the smartest person in the room, that's not me, uh, if you're used to being the smartest person in the room, what do you do? Well, you flash on it, like you do all the other things that you've been doing all your life. Flash on it, oh yeah, and you're articulate, and you're glib, and you say, and no more problems. So that nothing becomes difficult. And if something really difficult comes along and you can't flash on it, what do you do with it? You mystify it, okay? And it ends up, it ends up, in the back of the warehouse, the same warehouse, same government warehouse, where the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant is taken in the last scene uh, to Raiders of the Lost Ark. What happens when a person or a society continuously mystifies everything difficult that comes before them? Do I really have to answer that question? Right? That's what happens when deep literacy erodes. And finally, uh, the, of the third of the three, I think I'm running out of time, damn. The third of the three is what I call the end of modernity. Let me just try to go through this really quickly. Modernity is not just a word for what is contemporary. Modernity has a very specific definition in, in, in political sociology. And there are lots of definitions, but I'm going to use Daniel Bell's because I think I like it the best. Here is what modernity is, and it's coterminous with that joint phenomenon of the Protestant Reformation and the Enlightenment in the West. In the West. Number one, individual agency uh, ascends over communal agency, the individual. Number two, the idea of secularism, not just in politics as a neutral space to argue out differences of interest, but also secularism in terms of the arts. That no ecclesiastical organization tells an artist what he may or may not paint, may or may, what music he may or may not write, and so forth and so on. And third, probably most important, the idea of progress. That there is a teleology in history, built into history, or you could call it the WIG, the WIG theory of history, if you understand what W H I G, what a WIG is. Those three things taken together, that's modernity, and that defines essentially the Enlightenment in the West: Scottish Enlightenment, uh, English Enlightenment, French Enlightenment. That's 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 what modernity means. Yeah? I think that all three of those assumptions are under attack. Uh, I think uh, we've overdone in the United States. We've overdone individualism. Uh, we've we've gone we've We've gone to extreme forms of individualism, vitiated community, what Burke called the small plat uh, platoons of civic life. And I think people have reacted against that by focusing now against individualism. You know, when Barack Obama said, when he was president, when Barack Obama said, you know, to some businessman who built a business, you didn't build that. You know, it's the, it's take, it, it takes a village kind of language. That's just an example of the reaction against, you know, overwrought and excessive individualism. 
The second one, secularism, I think is also under attack, uh, basically or, or being undermined by what I would call a new pantheism that's associated with the radical environmental movement. Not that I, don't, please don't mistake me, I, I don't, I'm not saying that global warming is a hoax, not at all. But, but some of the, the, way that people, the way that a lot of people think about this, it's kind of an end of the world cult. And it has overtones of, um, of, this, of this sort of, uh, uh, it's, almost a, it's, almost a, it's a religious view. It's, it's, kind of, it's neopantheic. And then thirdly, um, when it comes to, um, to this, the idea, the idea of progress. You know, our scientists, our natural scientists used to be avatars of progress. Now they're the greatest doomsayers among us. You talk to these people, you know, uh, they get on uh, uh, NPR, what's the name of the show? Uh, Sci Science, Science Friday. I don't know if you have Science Friday in Singapore. Probably not. Too bad. And these guys are always telling you how, you know, how crappy things are and how we're going, going down the toilet. I mean, they're, the, the scientists are real pessimists nowadays. Right? They don't have big ideas. Uh, they, have, they have little sad ideas too, many, too, too much of the time. These are the ones that go out and talk. So all, here's the thing. American political institutions are based on these three ideas. America was born in the womb of the Enlightenment. It is the most Enlightenment-centric country ever created. How can the institutions be healthy if the three fundamental ideas on which they're based are no longer taken seriously or of which they're undermined? I mean, this is, again, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. So it seems to me that you need to take these three, I call them under turtles. You know the story about rocks all the way down, turtles all the way down. This is just one layer down from the seven, right? These three turtles, under turtles, you've got to look at these seven phenomena that I described earlier in terms of these three under turtles as, as more fundamental causes. So is that all? Am I finished? Is that the argument? No, I said seven, three, one. All right? Now, here comes the one. You all know about Isaiah Berlin, right? The foxes and the hedgehog, right? It's trite, it's overused. I don't care, I like it, I'll use it again. All right, so right now we're talking about foxes. So foxes know these seven things. And some other kind of fox knows these three things, but what does the hedgehog know? Here's what the hedgehog knows. The hedgehog uh, actually goes back, and the hedgehog speaks Greek. The hedgehog speaks ancient Greek. And the hedgehog goes back and he says as follows. <clears throat> and let me just uh, give it to you, not the way that it, well, it came out originally, but I'll give it to you the way that my, my, uh, my dear departed friend and colleague Samuel Huntington put it back in the 50s. And he said as follows. A value which is normally good is not necessarily optimized when it is maximized. Let me say it again. A value which is normally good is not necessarily optimized when it is maximized. Now, the American actress Mae West said the same thing in slightly different language. <laughs> she said, too much of a good thing can be taxing. <laughs> Seriously, this comes, if it, I, some of you I hope know where this comes from. This comes from book eight of the Republic. This is Socrates. This is the oldest idea in Western political philosophy, right? It has been forgotten, unfortunately, by uh, con the contemporaneous American political class, if they ever knew it. Founders knew it, but it's been forgotten. And what it means is, as Socrates explained, there are only so many pure forms of government that the Greeks could, could think of. And all of them have a bow ideal. They have a value that is best, all right? But because it's not possible to freeze any political order, all right, eventually people will overdo the pursuit of that value, and it will become counterproductive. It reminds me of Alan Greenspan's famous remark about adolescent irrational exuberance. This is what Americans are best at, because America is an adolescent nation compared to older ones. We have, um, in various ways and shapes and forms, we have overdone all of the values that are dear to us. And I want to just list some of you, some of them. And in the book, you can, you can find more detail. The idea of merit. There's nothing wrong with the idea of merit, on the contrary. But you can overdo it, right? You can, you can isolate it and crust it with lawyers and plutocrats, and you can overdo it. Democratic agency. There's certainly nothing wrong with, the, with, dem, with democracy and democratic agency. But in the United States, we have too much democracy in all the wrong places. One of the problems with the, 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 radical, the radical aspects of our, our political activities are these open primaries, right? Which we didn't have until the 1968, 1972 period. Right? There was a reason why political candidates used to be chosen in, in smoke-filled rooms. There was a good reason for it. It had its misanthropies too, but right now, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that uh, if there's a problem with democracy, the way to fix it is to have more democracy, it's a great applause line, but it's bullshit. It just isn't true. Right? 
open debate, all right, and so-called transparency is related to this. The idea that all political discussion should be transparent and that government should not be allowed to have any proprietary information. Nothing should be a secret. This is childish, but there are a lot of people who believe this. I mean, you know all who the transparency saints are, from Julian Assange to Edward Snowden and all the rest of them. This is nonsense. This is worse than adolescent. This is childish. Right? Uh, if you can't, if politicians can't sit in a room and make deals, if everything they do has to be public, how are the hell are they ever going to come to a deal? I mean, just again, use your common sense. Um, uh, due process. Due, pro everybody, due process is very important in the United States. It's part of our legal system. But if you open up standing to sue to every Tom, Dick, and Harry in the country, you get a, a, a NIMBY problem, not, not in my, my backyard problem, so that nobody can build new infrastructure, no matter how much the old stuff is falling apart. So you can overdo due process. Free speech. Free speech is wonderful. Americans, First Amendment, Americans fall on the sword over free speech. But when you ascribe free speech to corporations, right, you have gone weird and you have gone way too far. Okay? Uh, diversity. Diversity is a wonderful thing. Ameri e pluribus unum, that's what America is about. America is a diverse country. All right? But if you, if, you, if, you, if you don't set limits on diversity, in a context where there's no telos, where there's no collective purpose around which people can, 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 can collect, then what you have is a, is a permanent centrifugal force leading to absolute fractionation and, and, and collapse, social collapse. That's when the man on the white horse comes in. That's what the Greeks were, were talking about when they said that, that republics degenerate into democracies and democracies degenerate into tyrannies. Because they become so, so disoriented with, amongst themselves that they need a, a guy on a white horse to come and save them. That's, that's Aristotle. That's not Socrates. Technical, pro technical pro progress. There's nothing wrong with technological progress. We love technological progress. Makes us richer. Makes us happier. Makes us healthier. Makes us safer. Right? But you can overdo it. If you overdo it, if, if technological optimism turns into technological determinism, okay, you end up uh, basically scorching the earth, tearing down all the forests, and despoiling the environment, all on the basis of this, this obsession with technology. Look at the 5G thing. All right? Whatever you think of it, what is it really about? Well, one thing that it's about is about going faster. 50 times faster. 100 times faster. We want to go faster. We want to go fast, fast, fast. But everybody knows that speed kills. And I'm just talking about crystal meth now. I'm talking about, in general, speed kills. Well, so why do we want to go faster? What, do we ever think about this? I mean, it's not that, er it's not that we haven't had, uh, how shall I put it, uh, unfortunate consequences with certain technologies of the past or unanticipated effects that we could have thought about, it, but we didn't. All right? But we don't do, in the United States, we just don't bat an eyelash. We just, we just go straight ahead. And other cultures now are doing the same thing. And I just wonder how, how, how wise this is. Uh, then there is, almost finished, um, individualism. Oh, again, I mentioned before, we have now radical individualism from the, from the left for years, expressive individualism. We now have identity politics to go with it. And from the right, we have market fundamentalism, which introduces another kind of radical individualism. What's left of the community, <laughs> after you combine the individualism of the left and the radical individualism of the right, you have social trust hemorrhages left and right. You have bowling alone. You have sleeping alone. You have loneliness. You have deaths of despair increasing. That's what you have from this kind of individualism. The, the technology is very isolating. Every single kid that shot up at American high school has been deep into video games and was a loner. Every one, OK? Uh, free markets, all right? Free markets. We like free markets in the United States. Uh, but you can overdo that, too. You can overdo it uh, when you have a kind of turbo corporate capitalism that destroys social capital with an advertising culture that undermine, that disorganizes the stock of knowledge about what there is to buy out there in services and goods. Free markets can undermine social trust too. But we don't, they, but then on the other hand, we have this mere, meliorist, uh, uh, compassionate entitlements program, right? Which you can also, it's a good thing. It's good, it's good to be compassionate. It's good to care for the, for the people who are underserved and people who have been, who have been uh, 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 the victims of, of bigotry and, and racism. It's good to try to make amends. It's good to help, all right? But you can overdo that too. Like I said, we know we look like, the budget looks like an insurance company with an army, all right? And, and uh, accountability. It's the last one. There are, there are others, but I'm, I'm getting way too long. Accountability. Accountability is good. People have to be accountable, right? But do we really have to do it through an obsession with metrics? I mean, this No Child Left Behind stuff 
totally distorts the, the educational process. It, it makes it impossible for teachers to actually be the professionals that we want them to be. It totally, totally uh, distorts, deranges American education on the, the kindergarten through, through 12th grade level. Uh, again, there's nothing wrong with accountability. But you can overdo it. And this is what the Greeks warned against, that, that values that are good have to be balanced and they have to be modulated. And that's a, that's a, that's a function of, of prudential judgment among people that you, you, you select for your leaders. Well, the American, the American um, political class now for many years has not understood this. They have let the deal go down. And if there is a hedgehog idea in my, in my argument, this is it, that we have ignored the lessons of, cha of book eight of the Republic. All right. Now, finally, obviously what's going on in the United States has huge implications for American foreign policy. And that, therefore, has implications for the world. There will be a chapter in the book about that, but I'm not going to talk about it now. If you want to ask about it, you can do that. And finally, last chapter is about fixes. What can we do to fix this? Well, okay, a lot of this stuff is not fixable by political means. It's way too deep in the culture to fix. But some of it's fixable. Some of it's fixable. And more important than that, we need to change the mood in the United States. People are really pessimistic. People have become very cynical. In order for anything to heal and get better, we have to change the mood, which means we have to have something to do together, to build together. Because Americans are at their best when they have a pioneer vocation. And right now, for one of the first times in American history, we don't know why we're living together in one political community. There are a lot of, there are a lot of theories on offer, but there's no consensus about what we're doing together, living in one country. We need to recreate projects, things we can do together, things we can build together, right? Change the mood and buy some time and hope that these misanthropies will find a way to heal. And that is really the last chapter of the book. And last thing I want to say is, you know, like I said, this has been really hard uh, to get my head around this. I'm not finished. This is just kind of a, a preview, essentially, a, a report on work in progress uh, with Ambassador Ong's uh, permission. I might come back in uh, May or June and uh, give you a progress report, let you know if I've gotten anywhere you know, <laughs> over the next four or five months. So I'll stop there. I'm sorry I spoke longer than I meant to. Uh, I really tried not to, but I failed. Um, thanks for listening. I appreciate it.